pray that God knocks your socks off. I pray that there is a parking lot full of people without shoes on, okay? Amen. Amen. The first time I heard Dave Ramsey, who's ever heard Dave Ramsey? Right, it was fantastic. It was in Chicago, and uh, uh, it was at Willow Creek Church, and he was getting up to talk about how to get out of debt. And I was like, man, we're, we're in a lot of debt. I can't wait to hear what this guy has to say. And there was, there was great anticipation. Anyway, he came up, and he said, I'm going to give you the greatest advice, financial advice that you ever heard. And everyone was like, whoa, this is amazing. He said, I'm going to cure your financial problems. And everyone was like, man, this is, this is fantastic. Just, just tell us already. He said, I'm going to tell you something that will make sure that you will never be in debt again. And by this stage, people are like, please stop playing with us. Just, just what is it? He said, are you ready? I was like, we're ready. We're ready. I had my pen. I had my paper. I was down ready to, to write. And he said, spend less than you earn. <laughs> and I was like, What? And I was like, I, I already knew that. How's that going to help me get out of debt? I already knew that and I got into debt. You need to tell me something that I don't know. You've got to tell me something new, something that I haven't heard. And I use that point to illustrate that many times we'll come to Bible study or we'll go to church or we'll read a book and we're looking for something that we don't know. When the power of the Christian life is already what we do know. And it's living for Jesus. It's giving it to Jesus. It's prayer. It's being transformed by his, by his word. But we want something that we don't know so that we, there's something else that we don't do. I have one friend, and I don't want to point her out. She's standing at the back. But she said to me, <laughs> and there's a lot of people here, myself included, who loves to go to a bookstore and buy books that you're not going to read. You just feel so good about it. It's like just reading the title, it like it nourished your soul. Yes, yeah, I'm going to take two copies of that and, and one copy of that. And oh, how to pray more. Yes. Let me, let me get another book on something I'm not going to listen to. And we have to remember with this Bible study, I might say things that you have heard many times. There are going to be some videos that I hope you have seen before. And it's not about something brand new, it's about doing what has already been said. And when I learned to spend less than I earned, it was amazing how Dave Ramsey's simple advice made a difference in my life. Amen? Who loves those epic movies? What's your favorite epic movie like Gladiator? Who loved that one? Right or, or, or Braveheart? What is it about these, these movies that we, that we love? You know, what's the definition of a hero? A hero is somebody who's willing to risk their own life to save that of another or to rescue that of another. And everybody loves a hero. Everybody applauds a hero. Somebody who put themselves in harm's way so that somebody else could go free or be set free. What's, who's some of your favorite heroes? Who's some of your favorite uh, superheroes. How about Superman? Anyone? What are some other ones? What's your favorite? Spider-Man. Iron Man. The Hulk. Well, there's one that beats all of that. Who is the greatest epic movie hero of all times? Jesus, you're far too spiritual, okay? <laughs> That's just cheating, okay? You can't say Jesus. But I'm going to tell you who it is. It's Nacho Libre. It's the greatest, the most epic movie. If you've never seen it, go rent that movie. But what I've noticed with our culture is that there is a big disconnect between where our heart longs to be. Everybody longs to be a hero. Whether you're a man, a woman, a boy, a girl, everybody longs to live a life that is greater than themselves. Am I right? 
everybody loves to live, want to live a life that has more meaning than just building your own little nest and then dying at the end of your life. We, we want to leave a legacy and not just a memory. We long to do this. But our culture teaches us something very different. It teaches us to be safe. Safe. What is the definition of safe? To be protected from or not exposed to danger or risk. Not likely to be harmed or lost. Who likes to be safe? Come on, more than that. I know for sure. We like to be safe and we're taught to be safe. We watch movies about these great heroes that, that drive at great speeds and don't wear seat belts. But then we make sure we've got 18 airbags, our seat belt, and that we're driving the speed limit. We love to be safe. And I was trying to figure out why I'm such a risk taker. And I think it was because I was born in South Africa where we didn't wear seat belts. And my mom let us play with mercury. <laughs> I kid you not, we didn't know how bad it was. And when we were really well behaved, she would bring out the bottle of mercury and say, yeah, you got my boys. And we would push that around. Look, yeah, cool, it splits up, it goes together. I don't even want to know what's inside my body. <laughs> but what happens if to truly experience life we had to take risks. What happens if to truly experience life, we had to take risks? You see, we taught even at school, smart people are safe people. Safe people are smart people. And I'm not, I'm not speaking against safety. There's a lot of good, and America has saved a lot of lives because of the safe policy. But there's something else that happens. You're also taught, don't interfere, don't get involved if you're not a trained professional. Have you ever heard that? Don't try this at home. As wonderful as the police and the fire department are, and they are amazing in this country, they are really amazing, but we are taught to not get involved. Let somebody else handle it. You just call a number and just move on your, your merry way. Where Christianity paints such a different picture. It doesn't say call someone else to handle it. It says you handle it. You get involved. You be the hero. You don't wait for somebody else. And this series that we are going to talk about is how to become a hero. Who likes that? Do you want to be a hero in God's kingdom? Do you want to be somebody's hero where you stepped in to save somebody's life, but you cannot do it if you have to play safe? Heroes are willing to take a risk. Are you willing to take a risk? I pray that at the end of this series... We've got some people who might drive without their seatbelts on. <laughs> I've noticed something that we want to be comfortable. Who agrees? We want to be comfortable. Even when we have gone on a mission trip, we have tried to find comfort in that place where there seemed to be no comfort. No matter what it was, we would gather it. When, when we went to Mozambique and we had our little room, you know, we found an extra mattress somewhere where we could put on top of the other mattress to make the bed a little bit more comfortable. We just, we have this natural ability to just seek and want to create our, our little nest. But is that what life was supposed to be? To just be comfortable and then at 80 or 90 years old to just move on after we've built this lovely little comfortable nest. I think that God has so much more for us. A week ago or so, when it was so cold, I got into my car and I put my, my seat warmer on. And I tell you what, I did not know that joy that could come from warming my butt. I literally felt joy. Start here. And just rise up. And you say, but comfort is wonderful. And yes, comfort brings great Happiness, but comfort cannot bring joy because true joy comes from giving a life for the sake of others. Do you know that? But we, we are lied to all the time. No, you just want to be comfortable. You just want to have a nice chair and, and extra padding, extra foam. Then you'll be happy. You know, if, if your chair had three layers of foam, man, then you have got the chair that everybody needs to have. But what happens if life was about taking risks? What happens if the greatest things that we could accomplish came at the greatest expense to our own lives? You say, well, that's, that's crazy. I don't want to live a life like that. That's dangerous. 
Well, I tell you what, we've got some examples of some dangerous people in that Bible. And we're going to read about a dangerous man. And his name is Nehemiah. Let's turn there, Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1. Who here has never heard the story of Nehemiah? Thank you. The rest of you are very spoiled, okay? That's wonderful. Nehemiah chapter 1. I was at the fortress of Susa. Hanani, one of my brothers, came to visit me with some other men who had just arrived from Judah. I asked them about the Jews who had returned from captivity and how things were going in Jerusalem. Who here has dinner around a family table at least once a week? Or some sort of gathering around the table? You guys, you don't need tables. Man, you must have so much space in your homes. <laughs> when we get round and we start to discuss things, do you ever do that? And you start to discuss your day, and you start to discuss the people in your life, and you start to discuss the things that are going on, and you say, how is this going? How is that going? How's that person? How's your job? How's your work? Has anyone ever asked those questions? And we start to draw information out. This is exactly what Nehemiah is doing. But I want to tell you what Nehemiah's response to the question that he asked, and our response seems like it's two different worlds many times. Nehemiah 1 verse 3. They said to me, things are not going well for those who have returned to the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. Have you ever asked a question that when you got the answer, you wish you never asked that question? Somebody asked me the other day, they said, uh, Brent, how, how old's your dad now? Uh, you know, where, where is your dad? I said, he's dead. And they were like, <laughs> right? They wish they never asked that question. They didn't want to know the answer. And many times we are the same way. We ask questions that we don't actually want to know the answer. Who's ever done that? When I first came to the States, you see in South Africa, when somebody says, hello, how are you? It's because they meant, hello, how are you? And I found in the States, when someone says, how are you? They're just saying hello. So someone says, how are you? I'm like, no, I'm like, and they're gone. <laughs> I thought you wanted to know how I am. And many times, we don't actually want to know how somebody is. What about the person who stands at the traffic light with a homeless sign that says, need help, whatever it might be. I've got so good with my car that if I park just right, the beam of my car blocks them out. <laughs> and the rule is, if you can't see them, you don't have to give to them. Is that right? Because if you can't see them well, you don't have to feel bad because you don't have to look at their faces and you don't have to look in their eyes. So you've got to position your car right there or suddenly, oh sure, but I've got to look on the floor here. As they're walking past, I think I dropped something last week. <laughs> and we bury our head in the sand. Do you, you know that term? We bury our head in the sand because we don't actually want to know this answer. Let's go back to the family table with me. And we're sitting around and the father says, Son, tell me about your friend whose parents just got divorced. And he says, Well, Dad, actually, he's fallen apart. He's actually in hospital for alcohol poisoning and he has nowhere to live. You know what the dad says? Wow, what a shame. Pasta chicken. Pass the potatoes, fill my drink. Who's been there? Come on, be honest. We hear these things and we, and we hear these stories about people's lives. About this person's marriage who's failing. This person who's struggling. This person who's got this disorder. This person whose heart is broken. And we, and we think by saying, wow, that's really bad. That we have done our job as Christians to show compassion. 
Who's hearing me tonight? And then we say, pass the chicken. And then we carry on with our day and we just put our head in the sand. I want to tell you something that's phenomenal. That these walls had been down for more than a hundred years. Some scholars think nearly 140 years. How many people had walked past these broken walls in 140 years? Do you think that they saw that those walls were broken down? What do you think? Absolutely. Do you think they were troubled by the fact that the walls of the city were down and that city was in danger all the time, that they couldn't protect themselves? Do you think they knew how valuable it would be to have some walls? Who thinks? Of course, yes. Then why in 140 years did nobody build any walls? Did nobody have the idea? Did, did nobody think, I think we should build a wall? What do you think? Of course, people had the thoughts. Of course, people had the ideas. Maybe some vision and risk, they withdrew. Many times we want to do something as long as it doesn't cost us anything. As long as I don't have to risk my life, I want to make a difference. I've heard people complain and moan about so many things, myself included, that I was never willing to do anything about. Am I right? Those children today, they just so badly behaved. Why don't you start something for children today? The church that I attend, man, they are dead. Well, why don't you come alive? So we want to say the things that need to be done. How many people said, you know, somebody should build a wall? What do you think? What happens if we were there? We'd have little committees about how somebody should build a wall. <laughs> we'll write books on how good it would be if somebody would build a wall. And that's all these revival books are. Right? We, we, we confuse ourselves by thinking that if we read about revival, that we're actually going to have revival. When revival is never going to come by us reading about revival, it's going to come from us seeking and doing something to see a revival. And these problems that we have in Houston, the sex trafficking, the divorce rate, the abuse, all of these things, they are never going to be solved in our dining room until we are willing to bring those problems into our dining room. Until we are willing to bring hurting people in, those problems are never going to be solved. But we have got so good at putting our head in the sand like me with the beggar. That I feel like it's okay if you can't see me. My duty to God has passed. He didn't make our connection. That's what my little boy does. Joshua. <laughs> I want to show you how Nehemiah responded to this. 1 verse 4. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. We are in a culture where we have so many resources that we can keep ourselves busy just learning about the information. It's like a student who doesn't want to come out of college because they're so busy learning that they don't want to go to work. We have got so many degrees we, we, we know more than the disciples knew. Do you know that? What we don't have is the belief to put it into action. We have more knowledge than they ever had when Jesus sent them out. What we don't have is the ability to put our lives at risk so that Jesus' name can once again be proclaimed to all men. He sat down and he wept and he fasted. He couldn't eat. He couldn't sleep. He was so disturbed. Why was this? Here's what's interesting. Do you know that Nehemiah wasn't born there? He had never seen this city. He had never visited the city. There was no Instagram. Why was he so destroyed over the condition of the city? When lost, were we brought to our knees for the sake of others? When last did we realize that, 
that people in our office block, people in our apartments, people in our, in our street do not know Jesus and it so disturbed us. But you know how it looks? And the only reason I know this is because I've done it. We'll sit around our table and say, man, that person really needs Jesus. Who's ever said that? I wish someone would just share Jesus with that person. Right? Somebody really needs to step into that family's life. If only I had the time. And we come up with these excuses that make ourselves feel justified, like I said about blocking the bigger out with the beam of my car. I feel justified for doing it when it's utter nonsense. Do we care enough about those around us? When the needs of others no longer affect my heart, my Christianity has reached an all-time low. We think because we come to church and come to Bible study and we highlight in the Bible that we, have, we are now doing that verse. Who's ever done that? You like highlighted a verse in the Bible and you're like, wow, now I've got it. <laughs> now I have it. It's in blue. Look at that. <laughs> Love your neighbor in blue. And I dated it. I got this now. And we come up with all these selves for our conscience that we are actually doing what God has commanded us to do. But don't do it because you are commanded. Do it because you were once lost and now you are found and you want everybody to experience what you now know. Amen? Amen. The divorce rate is not going to change in Houston no matter how big our churches get until our church is willing to give up the time, the resources and put our lives at risk for somebody else's marriage. Do you know that? Do you know that people aren't going to stop being abused and and kids aren't going to stop going to jail until we are willing to inconvenience our life and our television shows, and our football, and everything else, and say, I don't want to watch TV because my heart is breaking for what is going on. Jesus, you have to do something. Start with me. Creation happened in this place. We line this place with people who didn't know Jesus, and now are crying out to Jesus, and we'll have the greatest party you have ever seen. When we are seeing people healed by the hundreds, we'll have the greatest party you have ever seen, better than a yacht or a jet can ever bring. And they bring some great joy, am I right? But when we are willing to get on our knees, and and I know, I knew when I was preparing this message that this might cost me numbers on a Tuesday night because people don't want to come and be convicted. But I'm not here to build the biggest Bible study. I'm here to build the biggest army. We can make a difference. And as long as we sit around our dinner table and we just talk about people's problems, nothing is going to change. But when we are willing to let it cost us and affect our wallets and affect our calendars and affect everything that we have, because Lord, there is no purpose to live 80 years and not to have done something of great value to the kingdom of God. Amen? I want to read you a poem, a beautiful poem. I'm sure you would have heard it. Was battered and scarred, and the auctioneer thought it was hardly worth his while to waste his time on the old violin, but he held it up with a smile. What am I bid, good people, he cried, who starts the bidding for me? One dollar, one dollar, do I hear two? Two dollars, who will make it? Three. Three dollars once, three dollars twice, going for three, but no. From the room far back, a gray bearded man came forward and picked up the bow. Then wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening up the strings, he played a melody pure and sweet, as sweet as the angel sing. The music ceased and the auctioneer, with a voice that was quiet and low, said, what now am I bid for this old violin? As he held it up with its bow. One thousand once do I hear two. Two thousand who will make it three. Three thousand once, three thousand twice, going and gone 
said he. The audience cheered, but some of them cried, we just don't understand. What changed its worth? Swift came the reply. It was the touch of the master's hand. I want you to know that this year, whether you have dust on you, whether your strings are a little tattered and torn, whether you have had things happen in your life and you don't think that God can play a tune through you, if you would allow the master to touch your life once again, he wants to produce a sound through you that is so amazing and so incredible that it will draw people in from all over because they want to hear that sound that he wants to produce through you. But you have to be willing to take a risk. You have to be willing for him to tighten a few. Oh, oh, oh. To make that sound. Have you ever seen a, a, an abused dog or, or an animal that you knew needed rescuing? And as you went up to, to, to see it, once you put it up there, it looked like it was going to bite you and it tried to bite you. And everybody walking past said, you know, somebody should help that dog. Have you ever heard that? Or well, somebody should do something. Do you know the only person who's going to help that dog? Is the person who is willing to get bitten. That's the only person who is actually going to go and make a difference in that dog's life. Is the person who knows there's a good chance I'm going to get a nip, a bite, maybe multiple. And until we are willing to take a bite for the sake of others, we will never be able to set them free from their cages and the things that they are going through. Until I'm willing to give up my free time, my, my Friday nights, my family time. You say, but Brent, but this is my life. My life was lost a long time ago. And you know what? My life wasn't that great. <laughs> Amen? Amen? I gave it all up for Jesus. Well, what did you give up? Well, you know, addiction, loneliness, insecurity. <laughs> right? And what did you get in return? An abundant life that rescues others. My DNA changed from that of a loser to that of a hero. Amen? The person who risks nothing, does nothing, has nothing, is nothing, and becomes nothing. He may avoid suffering and sorrow, but he simply can't learn to feel, change, grow, or love. Who here has ever taken a painkiller? Anyone? Me too. Okay. Why do we take painkillers? Because we don't want to feel pain. Why do we block out what's happening in other people's lives? Because we don't want to feel their pain. When we can't do it. We have to feel their pain. We have to invite their pain. We have to take their pain so that we can be on our knees and pray like we mean it and do something to change their pain. Sympathy is just saying, oh, I'm sorry. That's really sad. Sorry about that. Good luck. Compassion is rolling up our sleeves because we're going to do something. We're going to make a difference. Amen. And for your goals for 2014, as we said all of our things to increase business, to lose weight, to get married, whatever it might be. Why are you smiling at me? <laughs> I pray that your number one goal is to be used by God. That this year, at the end of 2014, you're not writing things that you accomplished. You're writing people's names that you reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. How's that for some goals for 2014? It is said, in order for evil to triumph, good men and women just simply have to do nothing. This year, let it be said of us that we didn't do nothing. That when we saw walls broken down, we put our lives at risk. And as you read Nehemiah's prayer, he goes before God and he pleads on behalf of people that he's related to distantly, that he's never been there, done that, but it's like, I have sinned. 
I have sinned. My family has sinned. Lord, would you restore? And we find out why he was so distraught and so distressed over the walls being down because these were God's people and God's people needed to flourish. God's people deserved to have a wall around them. God's people did not need to be lying in disgrace. And our church, I'm not talking about Second Baptist, I'm talking about our church globally, is a disgrace. Do you agree? When you look at what Jesus meant to be, how we ought to shine, we've had pastors having affairs, we have all these things, we are a disgrace. But I want you to know that the story of Nehemiah doesn't end at the disgrace and neither will our story if you're willing to risk it. You can change what has been for a hundred years, what has happened for a hundred years. Why can't it change with you? Well, that's just the way it's always been. Who says you can't be the person to change it? Nehemiah believed that he could do something because he was willing to try something. So many times we stop before we even try and we discount the fact while it can't happen. Well, maybe that dog's been like that always. Maybe that dog was just born crazy. Maybe he's got rabies. Well, I don't know if I can help those children. I know nothing about children. Well, I don't know if I could help that marriage. I'm single. Well, I don't know if I can do this or do that. And we discredit what we have. When if you would just allow the master to touch your life. And if you're sitting here tonight and you do not know Jesus Christ, I want you to know that your life can never produce the sound that it can with Jesus. It'll always be... But when you say, God, would you play? Would you take my life? Because you know what I was made for. This is my desire. To be used by God. It has always been my desire. I told my wife, I said, my greatest fear is that I'll finish this life and not have done what Jesus had paid so greatly for me to do. Amen? I pray that is your heart and that is your desire. And as we journey through this Nehemiah series, that we're not learning something, that we are becoming something. And I'm not the greatest preacher on the planet. I know you already figured it out. <laughs> you need to get out more, okay? <laughs> but I will tell you this, that if we can journey together, we will see the aisles of our churches streaming with people. And how did they get there? We brought them. We brought them. We got in their faces at the hair salon. And we got in their faces at the grocery store. And we got in their faces at the gym. And wherever it was, we were shining a light. And we were building walls where we saw them destroyed. And we didn't just sit at the dinner table and go, wow, that's really sad. Wow, that's, wow. All those people are hungry. Wow, that's really sad. Thank goodness. Thank you, Jesus, for dinner. Thank you that we have meatloaf when there are so many who don't. What a terrible prayer. <laughs> right? Lord, help me to give people some meatloaf. Help me to share my table. Help me to share my turkey. Help me to rebuild some walls. We're going to close with a song tonight. I encourage you, if you want to close your eyes and just listen to the words. And then after this, we're going to open up for prayer. And those, those are the prayer team who came and have been praying. I want you to come and pray. Whatever it is tonight, we start rebuilding walls. Who's with me? Amen? And don't think it's going to take a hundred years. When we are willing to risk it all, it's amazing what God can do so fast. Thank you.